So open up your Bibles to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8. We've been going through a series, this series originally planned to be four week series, and I think we're on week six, and these are the things that happen. So even behind, uh, you guys can kind of see, oh, we even changed the graphics. Are we, are we, Adam, you're just so on it, dude. Can we give it up for Adam, our creative director? I never know what his title is. He changes it every week. Sometimes he just wants to be the branding officer. Sometimes he's our creative arts director. Uh, he had our summer series graphics when I went through my slides early this morning. I was like, Adam, I'm not quite ready to jump in our summer series. We're still hanging out in Nehemiah. So... Uh, God has been at work, and so we've been having some fun together looking at this series. Now, um, it's my hope to wrap up Nehemiah this week, and um, next week, I really want to encourage you, please don't miss next week. I did a little uh, Facebook Live on my drive into church today for our entire online church family, uh, just letting them know that we are not showing online services this summer. And uh, some of that is to give us a little bit of a break. We're also working on some things, making them better for our future, uh, to be able to present our church and, and preach the gospel, share Jesus online. Uh, but I'm really encouraging people to, to come to the house. Uh, ain't no party like a Jesus party in the house. And uh, in fact, our sermon title today is Party Hard, all right? And so we're going to look at what it means to throw a Jesus party like no other, and so we want to encourage you to be here. Please don't miss next week. Because next week, what I'm going to be planning on doing, if I can get through this sermon, if I don't get through this sermon this week, then I'll do part two next week, and then the next week will be what I want to do. Um, but uh, my prayer would be to wrap up Nehemiah, and then even the, the four points that I want to give you as we look at Nehemiah chapter 8 today, um, I want to share with you specifically how the Lord has been speaking to me as it relates to Nehemiah where our church is right now and where God is calling us. And so next week, I'm going to be breaking down the four points. So you want to write down these points this week. And I'm going to share with you specifically how the Lord is calling us as a church to walk in these ways. All right. And so don't miss next week. Um, here's been our journey up to this point. Get ready. Rise up. Dream big. Finish strong, that took two weeks, and now this week, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 through 18, party hard, party hard. Uh, you've heard me say this before, uh, you can be so busy for Jesus that you forget about Jesus. Uh, that's the biggest challenge for a lot of us in ministry specifically, uh, we can be so busy for Jesus that we forget about Jesus. Well, I want to share something else with you. We can be so driven for Jesus that we forget to enjoy Jesus. And we're reading this story of how God calls Nehemiah after years and years of Jerusalem being vulnerable to attacks and overtaking by the enemy, we know that there's kind of three phases to what happens with the people of God, specifically in Jerusalem under Zerubbabel. Say that five times. Uh, you find the first return as they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Um, but as the temple is built, now they're vulnerable from attacks. And so God stirs within Nehemiah. Remember, Nehemiah hears that, oh my gosh, the walls have been broken. My people are um, vulnerable to another attack. And so he prays, he seeks the Lord, and the light bulb comes on, right? Now I am cupbearer to the king. God had already placed Nehemiah in the very position that he needed to be to be able to carry out the work of the Lord. And that's why we spent some time as a church I've told you the three focus theme of this series. Number one, embrace God's presence. Number two, equip God's people. Number three, execute God's plan. And so I really wanted to kind of fly by embrace God's presence, but remember the Lord kept us there for a few weeks. In fact, so much so, I closed our church offices for a week and a half. 
And I said, our staff's not doing anything except seeking the Lord and getting a little bit of time away with the Lord. And so we came back last week. Wasn't that amazing being at our PGH City location and uh, celebrating Jesus on top of the mount? And we had, you know, some fun together with the kids. And once again, I beat Ryan in cornhole. And so one of these days, he's going to beat me in cornhole. Just pray for him. But nonetheless, we had a blast together. And we saw that in Nehemiah chapter 6, right, after 52 days... And plant a seed. We're going to be doing something this fall for 52 days. After 52 days, the walls were finished. The walls were finished. And praise God for that, right? Well, as you continue to move on into this text, basically the, the walls are finished. When you go now into Nehemiah chapter 7, which is right before the text, I'm not going to take time reading this. Good luck trying to read it, right? Uh, There's a whole lot of names and numbers and different things like that. And so basically the exiles, the people of Israel return. They hear that the walls are built and so they come back. And it's a whole lot of counting of the people and getting everybody back in place. And why are you living in my home? That was my home, right? And so all these different things that are happening. And then we come to Nehemiah chapter 8. Now... We find on the scene here in Nehemiah chapter 8, Ezra. There's Ezra and Nehemiah. And if you go into the book of Ezra, chapter 9, chapter 10, um, you'll find Ezra's first arrival in Jerusalem. And you'll also find, and this is all before Nehemiah and all this other kind of stuff, the moral and spiritual condition of the people of Israel. Ezra, as he immediately enters into the city, right, as the walls haven't been built, he ministers. We've got some guests here from other churches or whatever else, and I'll say this to kind of have their back, but to also, I hope you are thankful for your pastors, right, for those who teach and preach the word. I also hope, as we talked about, remember, as the people of Israel were called to build, what did they build with? A hammer in one hand and what in the other? The sword. So we can't go to work just with our phones. We're dead spiritually. I love it. Vega sent me a picture of her at work. We want the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and what we do, right? Because why? When we are going about the business of the Lord and we're actually obeying God's call upon our lives to build what he's called us to build, there's an enemy, And he's constantly attacking. Pray for your pastors. There's an enemy. And he knows if he can knock out the pastors, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going to happen to the entire congregation. I believe no matter where you want to kind of fall things right now, and I was just in London two two, uh, weeks ago, and, and worldwide, globally, right now, the enemy is trying to take down leaders, pastors of churches. And he's planting doubts into people all over the world that nobody's good enough. Nobody can be good enough. And there are attacks left and right. So we see the importance of pastoral ministry here because Ezra immediately comes in. And Ezra doesn't say, hey, check out my five-step program on how we're going to do ministry. No, what does he do to minister to the people? He teaches and preaches the word. He ministers to them in the word of God. He prayerfully teaches them. And as he prayerfully teaches them, you can read about this in Ezra, Ezra, and then we're going to find, obviously, here in our text today, the importance of it. But the people begin to respond to and obey the very law of God. They are led to repentance. All right, so this is now a few years later. Nehemiah comes in, the wall's built. And just to show you the proof in the pudding of Ezra's pastoral ministry, consider now Nehemiah chapter 8. These people had been discipled and prepared for such a moment like this. I'm going to give you four things to lead us through Nehemiah chapter 8. Write this first one down. 
first thing we got to do, if we want to party hard, we got to lock in. Everybody say lock in. Nudge your neighbor that just went to sleep and say lock in. All right, verse 1, look at this. The walls have been built. The people are being counted. They're in. In verse 1 it says, And all the people gathered as one man. (laughs) That's hard to do today. You know, if I pass the microphone right now, and I just ask you something as simple as, um, what do you think about the temperature of this sanctuary right now? Do you know how many different responses we would get? What y'all don't understand is that I'm your pastor and I get to choose what the temperature is. So bring a coat. You don't want me to preach hot and angry. Um, if I pass a microphone around about music preference... Some of y'all were pretty pumped. There was no drums today. Some of y'all weren't. Some of y'all, old hymns, new songs, whatever. All right, so all these people gathered as what? One man into the square before the water gate. And now this is like the dream for every pastor in the world. And they told Ezra... Do you know how much of pastoral ministry is? Me telling the people. This is proof of Ezra's ministry. That happened long before the walls had been built. There was already a posture of leaning in of a desiring of the word of God. And this is the dream. I'd love, I'd love. I mean, I get opportunities and invites and all that kind of stuff, typically from other organizations or churches or whatever. I would love to get a phone call one day and say, Pastor Rob, I'm having a party at my house, and I'd love for you to come and teach the word. (laughs) That's the dream. Here, the people told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Two things we need to lock in with regards to this. Lock in, number one, together. Lock in together. They gathered here as one man. And it's so amazing. What are they united around? They're not necessarily united around Ezra's style of preaching. They're not united around the the way in which Ezra does church. They're united around the Word of God. And if I can say one thing, can we just make sure that we lock in together around the Word of God? This is what united everybody, the hunger for the very law, the book of the law of Moses, I think it's amazing that this two-month building program was an interlude to Ezra's teaching of the Word of God. This they saw as the greatest thing that they could ever do now that the walls had been built, was to rally around the Word of God. May we, Vintage Church, be a people that crave, that desire, that long for The word of God. I hope you run from the word of Rob. What we want here is the word of God. Now, don't give them too much credit. It's like when I went to Korea. I went to South Korea and trained pastors with my dad a few years ago and preached all over South Korea. I I, Seriously, in like a week and a half, I preached 50-something times. And my dad threw me into all the church plants around the country, and he did all the mega churches. I had more fun. And so as I went to all these churches and everything else, like, I'm telling you, every church in South Korea, and this is just unbelievable to me, every single morning there are prayer services in church buildings. 
every single morning. I'll never forget, we flew into Seoul and, and we went to the first church the very first morning and we were told we were going to be picked up at 4.30 a.m. We get picked up 4.30 a.m. and we go into this one area. We step into the church. The church is already a very large church as we can see. And as we roll into this auditorium at 5.30 a.m., there were 3,000 people in that place. And that pastor that had us behind the green room before me and my dad got to share a word stands up and yells, and I'm butchering it, I don't speak, you know, Korean. So I, I, it's something to the extent of, Gio, 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 which was Lord, Lord, Lord. And as he yelled that three times, everyone in the room, no one sat quiet, everyone in the room immediately started to pray out loud. So we would ask these churches, what is going on here? I can't get people to show up once a week at 10 a.m. They said, don't give us too much credit. Now we know this would never happen, but if you guys had the threat of Canada coming down to take over America, you'd be on your knees praying every day too. We know at any moment North Korea could come and take us over. We're desperate. These people, although the walls were built, were still very much scared of the enemies. All right, I'm trying not to speak evil against our country. Because a lot of us are defaulting, as we should. We're voting. We're tweeting about all of our rights and protections and freedoms. And all I would say is this, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Could it be possible as part of God's sovereign plan for our country to truly send revival, that things are actually going to get a little more evil? Could it be possible that revival isn't going to happen until it's actually really illegal for us to do what we're doing this morning? Just a thought. Don't, if you got any like, negative thoughts about that, Ben France's email. We're not just going to lock in together. We're going to lock in around. I can already tell we're only going to get through two of these points. I don't know if you've noticed a theme, but after embracing God's presence as a staff, I just, I'm tired of my agenda. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit keep taking this. So we're going to do two points. I can just feel it. There's no way. Unless y'all, do we need to order some lunch? Y'all want to stay here? Okay. Wendy's? Anybody? Now you want to leave. All right, lock in together. Number two, lock in around. And we, We've talked about this. How is it possible that the church came together, that they were able to lock in? It's because they locked in around. Notice Ezra didn't say, y'all come the people desired the word. They said, please, Ezra, teach. <laughs> there wasn't a huge marketing campaign on Facebook convincing everybody to show up to teaching. No, people showed up and said, Let's, we got to get Ezra here. He's missing out. We need the word. We need the law. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. I'm thankful. It's kind of what I get to do for pastors and preachers. But the real move of God is going to happen when all the people, all the people long for the word. All right, here's the second thing, and this is going to be all we do today. Lock in, lift up. Everybody say lift up. All right, so let's talk about the word of God. Wasn't it just powerful and 
and beautiful to kick off our worship service today, reading the Psalms, letting, letting the Word of God just kind of set the tone today. Just so thankful for our arts team that, that leads us. And, and yes, worship, yes, does happen with guys and girls that can lead us with instruments and hit B flats. Is that a thing? I don't know. Z flat, Z minor, whatever you do in the music world. And, and I'm thankful for the talent that we have. Can we thank God for those who lead us in music worship and all that? But, but guys, that's not the only form of worship. As I'm preaching the word, there's, there's worship in the preaching and the exaltation of the word of God. Here's another form of worship, living worship. As you go to work tomorrow, that's an act of worship. That's an opportunity for you to give praise and glory to our great God. But let's talk a little bit about the word of God here. Because as we lock in together, we lock in around. What are they locking around? They're locking around the word of God. So continuing on, look at verse 2. It says, so Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it, facing the square, before the water gate. All right, some of y'all are going to be like, all right, I'm not complaining about how long Pastor Rod is preaching anymore. Because he read from it from early morning till midday. So it would be like me starting at six this morning, and roll in all the way till noon. You can see you are really excited about that possibility. And he did this in the presence of men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were what? Oh, what is he going to be done? No. It says that they were attentive. Right? To the book of the law. All right. Once again, let me just give us perspective here. Do you know that this morning and this worship time right now, I'm not the only one that has responsibility? Do you know that as you've come here today, you also have responsibility? So I really want to encourage you, and I pray that we'd see more of a movement with this. You're not any less spiritual. I know some of you guys are taking notes to try and impress a girl right now. It's okay. I get it. But the reason why we take notes, we, we jot down notes, is because we actually believe in all our hearts that this moment of the word is not just for us. That it's so that we might be also proclaimers of the word. I'm going to show it to you here in this text, but this was not just Ezra's moment. You're going to find out real quickly it was the people's moment. This was a moment of leaning in, of taking notes, of receiving from the Lord so that they could go about and equip God's people and execute God's plan. And so they were attentive. They were leaning into the book of the law. And then in verse 4, it says, And Ezra, the scribe, stood on a wooden platform. It's kind of what I'm on here. That they had made for this purpose. I, I love that too. Ezra spent weeks and weeks building his own platform to stand up and then telling everybody to come and listen to him proclaim on this platform the word of God. I don't know what Ezra was doing. Most people think, most pastors, we just play golf all the time. That might be true. I don't know. But I love that it says they built the platform. I mean, there was such an eagerness for the very words of God. The people were the ones leaning in. Hey, what can we do to facilitate the absolute greatest moment, Ezra, for you to lift high the word of God? So that all the people would know how great our God is. What a moment. Like, just to remind ourselves, the walls are built. 
I mean, shouldn't the people at this moment be working on their, their, their flowers and their, their beds in their yard? Should, shouldn't at this moment people be, you know, going to Ikea and then spending 755 days trying to figure out those instructions as they put together their daughter's bed in the room? I'm just, just counseling for me. Anybody else confused by those Ikea directions? Ikea is not of the Lord. Looks good, but that's it. Shouldn't the people, guys, at this moment be concerned about themselves? Be selfishly locked into their own world? I mean, the walls are built. It's time for me. And they see a bigger purpose. To their provision. This is not about them. This is about God's grand story. And here they are, locked in, attentive, building a wooden platform. Now check out this, because Ezra ain't alone, <laughs> which is another proof of his ministry. For a true calling of a pastor is not to do the ministry, it's to equip the saints to do the ministry. And so here is Ezra, and Ezra has stood up on the platform, and just by way of presentation, and in the next couple of weeks, I keep telling you we're going to present, but we have a number of people who have been going through training, and we're praying for thousands more that would consider themselves stepping up in leadership within our church. It says, and beside him stood, and there's a bunch of names on the right hand. You try and pronounce them. I'm not going to do it. I might cuss. On the right hand. And then there's a bunch of names of people on the left hand. So here he is standing to the right and to the left are people that Ezra has discipled. Verse 5, it says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. I had a seminary professor. <laughs> I'm never going to, I might not finish this point. I had a seminary professor that, that taught us. He was old school, man. He was in his late 60s and just loved his love of the word. But he had such a high honor for the word of God that he, he taught us as young preachers that we could never, ever not touch the Word of God. But also, we had to <laughs> notice why I probably got a bad grade in the class. I'm not doing what he told me to do. But in his form of preaching, not only should I always be touching the Word of God to remind people that what I'm sharing with you today is not my words, but it's the Word of the Lord, but he also wanted, he said, probably like every two to three minutes at some point in the text, you need to point to heaven. I mean, it was the goofiest thing, I'll be honest. I love what he's talking about there, though, because we're lifting up. And here's Ezra above anything else, standing on a platform, helping people to understand this is the aim. This is what you need. Don't settle for the quick fixes that the world's trying to sell you right now online. Don't settle for the American dream in your career. Don't settle for all these things that the world wants to give you. Nothing is greater than our God. Here's the very word of the Lord. And I love this, for we just participated in what we're about to read. For he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. There's something powerful about that. We should do that more. With the reverence, with the honor of the word of God. But then check this. It says, and Ezra blessed the Lord the great God. And all the people answered, Amen! Amen! And then the band started hitting their Z flats and the lights went down and there was a smoke machine with lights and no, the band doesn't even show up. And right here, 
It says the people, after giving God a little praise party, they're partying hard at this moment. Because of the word of God, they lift up their hands. And they bowed their heads. And they worshiped the Lord. with their faces to the ground. Just if you think that the leadership team is the only leaders that the church needs, here's some more names that if I start pronouncing, I'll definitely cuss. Verse 7, also, Jeshua, and Bani, and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while people remained in their places. <laughs> wow. So what we're learning from this text is that all you need is a pastor to stand up and preach, and that's all you need in the church. Here's Ezra, and he's just catalyzing the movement. And as he proclaims the word, now he has spent time because he's been a good pastor for faithful years. And he's sending now equipped people to go out. And look, there's Johnny on the front row and he's cross-eyed. He doesn't understand what's going on. Hey, bro, can I help you understand Leviticus? That's what they're teaching. This is confusing to me. I, how does this connect into my life? And, and here the people, the leaders start to Help the people to understand the law. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly. And they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. I, I just love this picture. And, and as I've shared with you, we're embracing God's presence. But starting last week, we've shifted into a season of equipping God's people. And I want you to know that if you would like to grow in the word, and if you'd like to grow in your understanding of not only the word, but how you could be a leader of proclaiming the word, this summer we're going to start rolling out some very clear steps on how you can be loved and served. But I got a little disclaimer for you. Every single person that takes a next step to want to learn the word, to want to grow in the word, I'm just going to let you know we're also going to be teaching you to be proclaimers of the word. And so just know, you show up in one of these environments like our small groups, our B groups, like some of our training, we come right out the gate and we anticipate that God's going to use you to also perhaps lead one of those groups. This is the very picture of why you and I have Jesus today because Jesus didn't just pour into a few and say, we're good. No, he called them to go and make disciples of what? All nations. How many of y'all want to know of someone who's not here today that needs the love of Jesus? Anybody in the house? This is what we are here today to do. And so, two things. Lift up the word. We're going to lock in. We're going to lift up. We're going to first of all lift up the word. This is proclamation. <clears throat> Why, church, do we lift up the word? Listen to Psalm 19, verse 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb in your office at work hanging with your friends at church here 
lift up the word. Lift up the word. But number two, lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. If lifting up the word is proclamation, lifting up your hands is surrender. So when the word of God here was proclaimed, what did the people do? Amen. Amen. Now, let's not get real spiritual first. Um, and I know this could be sensitive, but typically, I don't know if you come to a church, you've been a part of a church in the past that has people, Pastor Jake just encouraged you guys to lift up your hands. This is what I think about in moments of worship when I lift up my hands. Do you know what I think about? So when we sing songs like, yes, I will, right? There's something in my spirit. My dad calls it my soul spirit. There's something in my soul spirit that resonates. And I believe that's the Holy Spirit. And what he's doing in that song is he's, He's speaking to you about something that you're like, yes, I will. Or, man, that's powerful. Or, oh God, you are so great, I'm not, which leads me to repentance. And all I'm doing in this moment, when I in worship, and I love, we had a couple people lift their hands right now. I hope it would happen more often while we're preaching. But it's just in a, a moment of a, agreement of surrender. If somebody shows up, this is the sensitive part, with a gun, what are you doing? Symbolically, when there are moments from the Lord that just speak to my soul spirit, I want the Lord to know I'm in. That right there, Lord, I'm in. And this is easy right now on Sunday. I'm in on Thursday. Y'all with me? The word drives us to surrender. All right. Let's stay on the word. How am I going to land this plane? Let's read Psalm 47. We're not going to have any music, Jake, or let's just let the word, let's let the word be our drive out the door today. All right, so Ezra stood among the people. It said that he opened up the word. What else did it say? All right, you're the people. What did we learn? What did the people do when the word was opened up? They stood. All right, so let's stand. That's it, man. Thank you. And that's the people leading. That's that's examples. Now, I'm going to do this at least at first phase. I'm going to ask minimally, Jake, would you stand to my left? Ben, would you stand to my right? Yep, come on up here. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm be I've got to be higher than you guys, though. Mainly because I'm insecure. But Ezra wanted the word. This wasn't about Ezra, was it? Ezra wanted the word to be above all. Right? I didn't have time to turn there. And so we've got Psalm 47 here. This is what I would love 
for us to symbolically do after I read Psalm 47. And when we bring that to a close, then I'll lead us in some next steps. But I just want this moment to be this moment. After I finish reading Psalm 47... I do want you to know that symbolically we have three pastors in our church right now and, and they're taking their role as pastor and new pastors of our church serious. We're beginning a season of training and equipping for them as they hope to also multiply a leadership team. We have a staff. We've talked about this over the last few weeks. We have a volunteer leadership team and, and, and we're praying for that just to keep multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. And so Jake and Ben are here to also offer themselves to you. Is there anything that they could help you in understanding the word? And, and they don't say anything about Ezra, so I'm going to go play golf. I'm just kidding. But that's also my role, right? So we see this beautiful picture of the people standing at attention as Ezra opens up the word. And could we do this? When I finish reading the word, could we say very loud, amen, amen, and then give Jesus a shout of praise in this place. Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Y'all can say amen anytime, any moment. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord, with the sound of a trumpet, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Church, Amen. Come on, let's give God a shout of praise. Come on. Come on. We don't need music. Thank the Lord. Yes, Jesus.